Indonesia is absolutely fascinating in many ways, but one of the ways it's fascinating is that essentially it is at the moment the biggest natural experiment for policy and politics in the world. What's happened is that it's gone from being a very, very highly centralized state um, where essentially one ethnicity, um, which is a dominant ethnicity, uh, controlled the rest of the island. And some people joke, oh, we just swapped the Dutch colonizers for the Javanese colonizers, you know, really no big difference. But they were governing through a set of laws that were set at the center, by the center, for the rest. In 2001, that changed completely and radically. So after the end of the Suharto era, that all got turned on its head. So now Indonesia is governed, the daily lives of Indonesians essentially are governed at the district level by people who are locally elected at the district level. Now I keep a fairly regular check on how many districts there are. Um, and last week, to the best of my knowledge, there were around 540 something. But the ministry's own, the Ministry of uh, the Ministry of Internal Affairs um, itself, uh, isn't entirely clear how many there are. Um, but over, over well over 500. Um, and what that means is, supposedly, if you go with the political theory, well, we take the decision making closer to the people, and that gives you better outcomes and more democratic outcomes. Facts are yes and no. Um, broadly speaking, I would say that over time it will yield a good outcome for most Indonesians. But in the transitional period, there are some very, very dangerous outcomes. So one of the things that's happened is that the locally dominant ethnic group um, has become very often politically dominant also. And what that means is that a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the patronage opportunities are being dominated by that group. Like talking about India or China or especially China, uh, many other nations, you know, people who work in the, development industry, whatever that is, um, tend to think that you know, international institutions have a big part in the dialogue, whatever. In Indonesia, they absolutely don't. They are this. I mean, they are so marginal. Um, they really have very, very little policy influence. Um, the only, I would say, institution that has any policy influence at all is, is possibly the World Bank, um, because they work with the National Planning Board. Much more importantly, how does the Indonesian government itself manage the decentralization of power and of decision making to this great diversity of uh, different local governments? What's very, very interesting is that decentralization has changed people's lives out of all recognition at the periphery. But the realization of decentralization has not been fully absorbed at the center. So the central government is still behaving as though they're in charge. And they actually haven't fully realized the extent to which they're really not in charge. Um, so an awful lot of actual day-to-day -day policy making by which those national policies are supposed to tr trickle down um, to the local level are actually extremely fragile. Um, so what you've uh, and obviously that's potentially a dangerous thing. On the other hand, what's very interesting is that because of the um, direct elections at the local level, you do have people who are completely outside of the traditional political elites who are getting elected. 
and who do come in with different agendas and with different thoughts, and they are experimenting. And so that's why I say it's a great natural laboratory. You've got all these 500 Petri dishes, you know, in each area of policy, each doing their own thing. And some of those experiments are actually very successful. The Declaration of Independence of Indonesia reads, in its entirety, we the people declare the independence of the Republic of Indonesia, the details of the transfer of power, etc., will be worked out carefully and as soon as possible. Now, arguably, 70 years later, they're still working on that, but the fact is, they made a political decision and then they experimented, some things went right, some things went wrong, they muddled through, there was a crash, there was a meltdown, but in the end, we have a coherent nation. And so it is with the health insurance. Is it perfect? No. It, you know, but, but actually, having made a political commitment to make it happen, and having encountered a, a, a confluence of factors, including international development fashion, very important, that open doors to allow it to happen, bringing in the experiments that are happening at the local level, um, synthesizing those and seeing what we can do at the national level, negotiating this emerging relationship between the citizen and the state, which has never really existed in Indonesia before. It was always the ruling class and the subjects, essentially. It's always been a more or less a feudal uh, system, including through colonial times and certainly through the first two um, regimes of independence. Now we've got this burgeoning democracy, very decentralized, the citizen is emerging as someone who pays taxes, sometimes, um, but certainly is feeling that they have demands, that they have a right to make demands. Um, they express those demands through five yearly elections at the very local level, electing someone that, whose face they see, they know, looks like them, the same ethnic group, etc. In that renegotiation, there's space for all kinds of miracles to happen. And I think health insurance is one where, yeah, it's messy, it'll be imperfect. People have, people's expectations have risen much faster than the ability to meet those expectations. But some kind of health insurance by the end of this decade.